Okay, well, welcome everybody. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some web of science tools and tips for researchers. And for those of you who don't know, Web of Science is part of Clarivate. Um, it's a citation index. And um, so this talk today is very much focusing on academic publishing. Um, and I'm personally head of the Web of Science Academy, which is an online training course that focuses on peer review. So a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about today as well is very much from a peer reviewer's perspective. So um, I'm going to talk very briefly about what the Web of Science Academy is, just very quickly, um, and also why you should get involved with peer review. But then the majority of the uh, webinar is going to focus on research integrity with a focus on research integrity within publishing. I'm going to talk about conflicts of interest, biases, and also um, misconduct within publishing, again, from a peer review perspective. And I'm going to talk a little bit about predatory publishers, what they are, different types um, of predatory publishers that are out there, and also how to identify them and, and avoid them. And that kind of ties in with choosing the right journal for your manuscript. And we're going to talk about the free tool that we have, the master journalist, um, and also talk about different journal characteristics you might um, be aware of that can help you choose the right journal for your manuscript. And then at the end, I'm just quickly going to go through researcher profiles. Um, talk a little bit about bibliometrics, uh, why research fields and keywords are important, different platform options, and also promoting yourself. And then at, again, at the end, there should be plenty of time for questions. Okay, so first, what is the Web of Science Academy? So it's an online um, training hub for uh, online training courses. Focuses on research integrity, very much um, peer review, but also we've got a course in good citation behavior. And later this year, we are releasing a course on an introduction to um, sort of ethical publishing behavior. And um, they're free, you can just sign in, create a profile, um, enroll, and then complete the courses when it suits your um, schedule. So they're sort of on demand. And you get a certificate after each um, completed course. And you just go to websitesacademy.clarivate.com, but all, um, your all sort of um, websites or links that I'm talking about this talk will also be at the very end, the last slide as well for easy sort of reference for later. Um, the aim of the Web of Science Academy is to teach important skill sets within research integrity. And that's why we focus a lot on peer review, more specifically writing helpful and valuable peer reviews that are helpful both to the authors and the editor. And then we have this peer review report sort of template that can help you do that. Um, but we also have other courses, of course, um, covering referencing correctly and also ethical conduct within publishing. So that was just really quickly about that. I hope you'll um, have a look later after this talk. Um, so now you might wonder, you know, why, why peer review? Why should you get involved with peer review? Well, of course, it's it, it does help make you a better author, being able to critically read other research is really important, um, both for when you are searching for other research online that you might wanna build your own research on. If you're doing a literature review, for example, you might, um, be able, you might wanna be able to sort of tell the good research from the maybe not so good. It also makes you a better author in the sense that when you're submitting your own manuscripts to a journal to get published, you can read it from a peer reviewer's perspective. And of course you can help colleagues and friends as well to look over their manuscripts before they submit them. And then might hopefully decrease it's the time for it to get published because there'll be less changes needed. It's also a different way that you can connect with journal editors. So of course, when you submit papers to a journal and um, as an author, that's one way you connect with journal editors. But through peer review, that's just another way that you can sort of network and connect with journal editors within your field. And that can eventually lead to getting invited to editorial board. So you might be a peer reviewer that's sort of called upon more frequently, or you might actually end up um, being offered an actual editorial editor role. It also helps you stay up to date with the latest research. So of course, as you might know, you do your research, you write it up, you submit it, it'll usually take a year or more. So being a peer reviewer, you actually see research before it's published. Um, so way ahead of time, you know, months ahead of time. And it's also a way to sort of give back or provide a service to your field. So when you're publishing manuscripts, 
you have maybe two or three peer reviewers that are putting their time into making your research better and improving the quality of research published within your field. The peer reviewing, um, sort of volunteering to peer review for others is sort of a way to give back or a lot of researchers like to sort of even out that sort of balance. So that's just sort of really quickly about um, why it might be helpful to get involved with peer review and what they can do for you as well. Now, um, research integrity within publishing. What do we mean with that, of course? Um, I've divided this uh, section into sort of three parts. We're gonna kind of talk about conflicts of interest, both as an author and as a peer reviewer. I'm gonna cover biases, sort of unconscious biases we might have when we're peer reviewing, and also identifying misconduct when you're reviewing other manuscripts. So conflicts of interest, what do we mean with this? So when you're invited to peer review a manuscript for a journal, before or when you're sort of going to make the decision whether you need to accept or decline, you need to declare whether you have a conflict of interest. And this could be, for example, if, um, if you receive a manuscript to, to review and you can see that it's actually a close friend, one of the authors is a friend, or a current colleague, or it might be a current collaborator. The editor might think this is fine, but you do need to declare that potential conflict of interest and just let them know. And so, I think someone might have raised their hand. I'm not sure if Oscar can get to that. Um, so yeah, so, so if you do see that, you know, if you're being asked to review a paper and it's someone that you know really well, one of the authors, do let the editor know that you might have conflict of interest and then they can decide whether, you know, that's too much of a conflict of interest and that you can't review it and more of it's fine. Another sort of more ethical um, potential dilemma is if it's a paper that would be considered a competing paper to something you're working on currently. And um, so again, you might unconsciously and uh, not want, you know, not favor that paper very well because it's a direct competition to one of your, to your research. You should also declare a conflict of interest to the editor then and let the editor decide if that's, um, if that's okay or if it's better for you to not review that paper. Um, a different situation is when you are, are an author and you're submitting your paper to be published in a journal. You're also expected to declare a sort of if you have any conflicts of interest. This is often called a declaration of interest. This is the example that I've added in here as well. So you need to declare if you have, you know, conflicts when it comes to the results of the study. For example, do you work for an industry body or a commercial company who might directly financially benefit from the results? So this example here, um, so this is usually a section in, in the manuscript when it's published, you'll have a declaration of interest. You can see the authors here with their initials, some of them it says that you know they received funding from you know these companies or they've consulted for these different companies or they have a patent application you know currently filed so again it might not mean that they have a direct conflict of interest but they've declared that there might be a conflict there so this is for readers for peer reviewers and for editors to take that information into account when they're reading the paper or or peer reviewing it or or evaluating it and the third um, example here is when you are reviewing a manuscript, you should check for this, if there is a statement, a declaration of interest statement. And you can think, you know, do you think there might be, do you think, do you think that if there is any funding or anything, is there an actual funding statement? Or do you think that um, the funders might have influenced the results somehow? Do you think the study was actually done in an objective manner? Or are you worried that, um, there seems to be some sort of conflict there, but they haven't um, stated it. For example, if you're asked to review a paper on that smoking uh, is actually really good for your health, but you can see that the research has been funded by a major tobacco company, then you might you know, definitely take that into account when you're reading the paper and reviewing it as well. In all of these situations, if you're ever in doubt, you declare a conflict of interest and just let the editor decide, okay? Um, biases. So unconscious biases is when we discriminate against um, someone or a, or a piece of research based on some limited or some certain information about that person or that research. That could be a gender, whether it's a male or a female author. It could be based on the country that the authors are from 
or it could be the institution, it could be, so this could be both a positive or a negative. So for example, if you're asked to peer review a manuscript and all the authors are from, let's say Harvard University or a really good university, you might subconsciously think before you even looked at the paper that this is gonna be really good research, it's gonna to be top quality. And similarly, if it's a paper and you don't recognize any of the author names, you don't recognize the institution names, you might subconsciously think like, oh, I've never heard of this place before, it can't be very good then. Um, when for, within certain fields, there might be, you might have some sort of bias against the other school of thought. So within some fields, there might be maybe two main methodologies or two main theories. And if you're researching, publishing within one theory, you might have a bit of a bias against the other theory. So it's just something to be aware of that you might have these biases when you're peer reviewing. And one way that you can prevent some of these biases is by always reviewing in the same sort of structured way. And one way to do that is by following a peer review template um, or, or a checklist and trying to focus on trying to focus on the research and not so much who the authors are or what institution they're from. And this is of course why within the uh, social sciences and humanities, quite often peer review for journals is double blind. So as a reviewer, you do not know the names or the institutions um, of the researchers. And that's to sort of focus more on the, on the research, not so much on where they're from. So when it comes to um, misconduct, of course, there's many, many different forms of scientific misconduct. We're going to focus on publishing misconduct. There's many different types, such as plagiarism, data falsification and fabrication, image manipulation, even authorship claims, such as gift authorships. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about peer review rings, just so you're aware what that is. Confidential confidentiality during the peer review process is also a form of misconduct or failing to disclose conflicts of interest. These are all of various levels of severity, how serious they are. Some of them could just be due to like negligence or carelessness, and some of it could be intentional, like actual fraud. And depending on the severity, there could be different penalties. It could be a simple, simple retraction, like the paper might be retracted at a later date. Um, or more serious, you could actually lose your job, or even more serious again, if it's a lot of funding money we're talking about that was not used in a correct way, of course, that could lead to um, uh, fines and even prison. Making sure that oh, it looks like Oscar's getting to his questions, awesome. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the different types of misconduct. And again, most of these is from a peer reviewer perspective. So when you're reviewing manuscripts, what kind of things to look for. So plagiarism is when data or text is copied from another source. They're not referencing it to the original source. Even when someone is copying their own work from another paper, it's also a kind of plagiarism called self plagiarism. If a researcher is reusing data, like figures, for example, they must cite the original source. And if they're reusing full, like short passages, sort of several sentences or a whole paragraph, that does need to be within quotation marks. There are some um, exceptions, for example, when it comes to methods or analysis tool descriptions. Within some fields, it can be really difficult to provide it in a different way. You know, you, you shouldn't go out of your way to write something differently than like you did in your previous paper if it makes it you know, less readable, for example, it should just be clear. Um, and also, yeah, while reviewing, if you do see a passage or something that just looks really familiar, do a quick web search. Um, it's not necessarily completely on peer reviewers. A lot of editors have plagiarism tools, so they can look at that as well. But it's just, if you're reviewing the paper, you do notice something, it's always worth um, letting the editor know. Data falsification and fabrication. So the difference between these is that falsification is changing of real data. So a researcher might have done these experiments, they might have collected the data, but it didn't quite turn out the way that wanted it. It doesn't quite fit their hypothesis. It might not be significant. So they're so they've changed the data a little bit to make it you know, more significant or have higher impact. Data fabrication is the complete invention of data. So that could be 
making up an experiment that they haven't even done and completely making up the data. So as a reviewer, if you do ever get asked to review a manuscript and the data just looks too good to be true, too clean, do question it. Um, and you can always bring it up with the editor in the confidential comments box. So when you're submitting your review, there'll be a, either you can just email the editor if you suspect something, but there's also usually a confidential comments box that you can write um, to the editor if you, just, like, if you just think something looks a little bit too good to be true or a little bit suspicious. Um, here's just a few examples. So when I was doing my PhD at the University of Copenhagen, there was a major case that was very controversial. Um, there was this newer scientist um, who had, it later turned out that she had made up experiments that she hadn't performed and she had misused a lot of funding uh, funds that she had gotten from these uh, funding bodies. So the university actually ended up stripping her of her doctoral degree. Um, and she also had to pay back a lot of fines back to the, the funders. Um, and over here, um, maybe a little bit more recently when it comes to COVID, for example, I'm not sure if you guys have heard, but there was a lot of papers um, published in top, top journals like the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine, but they were all based on data from this Surgisphere um, Corporation. And it turns out that a lot of the, the raw data couldn't be verified. So a lot of papers were retracted because of that. And then just as an example down the bottom right here, just to show how misconduct within um, academia and publishing can have real life consequences. So there was a doctor in the UK, Wakefield, who published a paper uh, quite a few years ago now that the MMR vaccine, um, there was a link to autism, which later turned out that there was a lot of data fabrication or no sorry data falsification I think he sort of cherry picked what data to use and sort of the way he was analyzing and showing it and I think he also failed to do, declare a conflict of interest that he had a vaccine sort of patent going that had a version of that vaccine without the uh, metals or whatever it was that he said was what was causing autism even though that paper has been retracted and it hasn't been able to be reproven it's still causing some vaccine hesitancy even today more than um, a decade later so it can be really serious and have real life um, consequences. So it's important to sort of catch that. Image manipulation, um, that could be both a form of fabrication or falsification. So as an author, when you do have figures um, or images, they can be adjusted if you need to sort of make them clearer or um, changing the size, but that should be done to the whole image. Um, it shouldn't be, to eliminate or misrepresent the data in any way. And as an author, you should always have the original file. So if the editor or peer reviewer has ever asked for an original file, then you do need to have that at hand. And this example here is from a paper published by Elizabeth Beek. She used to be an editor for MBio and it's kind of her, her hobby. I think she does, a lot, uh, she checks a lot of paper within her field of microbiology um, for image manipulation. And she's really, really good at catching it. So this example here in the A, you can see the two panels in green and in blue. It's just been copied and pasted and they've just changed the size slightly. That's supposed to be different experiments with different treatments, um, but they've just been copied and pasted. And in the example of B, that's some gels, I think some electricity gels that have been run. And again, each line should be a different um, treatment or different experiment. You can see in red that those um, gels are identical has just been copied and pasted and the images have been sort of manipulated. When it comes to authorship claims, um, so again, this is very hard, of course, to detect um, as a peer reviewer. This is perhaps something more to be aware of as an author yourself. Um, different journals will have different requirements for what is enough to be given authorship on a manuscript. A lot of journals nowadays ask you to disclose what your role was in the research and the manuscript preparation. You've probably seen that in a lot of um, papers published, it'll have all the initials of the authors and say, you know, this particular person, you know, did the field work and did the data analysis, this person, you know, wrote the manuscript and also provided, you know, this and this material, et cetera. If someone hasn't done enough work to get authorship, but is on the paper anyway, it's called gift authorship and is a form of misconduct, especially if um, there is dishonesty around what their participation in the research or manuscript preparation actually was. Um, and you yourself, if you're asked um, to be an author in a paper and you feel you've not 
contributed significantly towards the work. Um, you can always say, hey, it's just fine to thank me in the acknowledgements, or you can ask to be more involved and say, you know, can I do more data analysis or can I help out more with the, you know, the manuscript um, revisions or anything like that. If it comes out that um, there was gift authorships involved, our often papers will, will we publish them with an updated authorship list or in serious cases, they might even reject the paper altogether. Um, peer review rings. This is just to make you aware of, you know, how difficult <laughs> the work is of editors, actually. Um, sometimes um, fake emails and fake names are used to review one's own work, or maybe that of a friend or a colleague so that they can review your work in turn. Um, and this is usually very poor quality peer review. And if it's discovered, it could lead to multiple retractions. I think there was something that happened in China last year where there's hundreds of uh, papers um, were retracted because of several authors, several all sort of part of this peer review ring. Again, this is usually when editors have difficulty finding enough reviewers for a manuscript. They might end up asking the authors if they can recommend someone. This is when they're putting fake emails and fake names, unfortunately. And breaching confidentiality during the peer review. So when you're asked to review a manuscript, um, you kind of sign a confidentiality agreement in a way between you and the journal because the paper, the research hasn't been published yet. Um, so you should do everything you can to not um, allow it to be plagiarized. So that could be, you know, sharing the manuscript with friends and colleagues, sometimes even printing it out at a shared um, printer in your lab and then forgetting about it. Um, you just have to be really careful with that. Usually editors allow a manuscript to be shared with a junior colleague if it's for training purposes. So for example, um, you know, PhD advisors might have a few postdocs or PhD students that they would like um, to learn a bit more about peer review and they'll ask the editor if they can co-review with them. So that's usually fine if they're just sharing that manuscript with a closed group of people. Um, another um, situation where it's fine uh, to share some part of the manuscript is if, um, for example, you might be asked to review a paper and you, you know about the analysis methodology, but one of your colleagues is even more of an expert when it comes to that methodology analysis, for example. So you can, you can ask them, you, know, you can say, hey, I've been asked to review this paper, they're using this kind of data, this is the analysis they're using, what do you think? As long as you're not saying anything about what journal it's for, any names of the authors or any institution or anything like that. That's um, generally fine as well. Um, if you don't disclose conflicts of interest, so you do have them, and that's both as a reviewer, for example, if you have a relationship with one of the authors, or as an author, if you have a personal commercial gain, like a direct personal commercial gain from the research, um, and you do have a conflict of interest, you should disclose it. Or, for example, as an author, if you've received grants or funding from a company or an organization that might have an interest in your research, you also need to disclose that. Failing to do that is a form of uh, misconduct as well, sort of ethical misconduct. So what should you do if you do suspect misconduct in a paper? That could be both that you've asked to review, but it could also be a paper that you just have read that's been published and you've read it and found it and you think there's something suspicious going on. Contact the editor. You can also refer to COPE. So um, the Committee on Publication Ethics is a nonprofit that have really good guidelines. That's publicationethics.org. Again, that um, link is also included in the very last slide um, in this presentation. And then just have a lot more sort of checklists and information about what you could do in those situations. Um, yeah, that's just quickly sort of on the ethics within research um, publishing. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, editorial publishers, which sort of will tie into the next section, which is choosing the right journal for your manuscript. In case you're not aware, I'll just um, talk to you a little bit about what predatory publishers actually are. They might be called different things, but we're just gonna call it predatory publishers in this talk. And um, there's many different types of predatory publishers. I'm gonna go through a couple of them, and then also some tips on how to avoid them. So what are predatory publishers? 
Here is a quote from a paper published by Grinovic et al. in 2019 called Predatory Journals, No Definition, No Defense of Function Nature, 2019. They say predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. What does that mean with, when I say misleading information? So on their website, they might have fake impact factors. They might say that they have an impact factor, but they don't. They might have an incorrect address. They might say that they're based in a country, different country than the country they're actually based in. There might be misrepresentations of the editorial board. So that means they might have really top or prominent um, well-known uh, researchers within a particular field say that they're on the editorial board, but they've actually not, they're actually not, or they haven't even asked these people, they don't know anything about it. They might also claim that they've been that they're indexed in you know, scopus of the web of science or that they're members of these different associations when they're in fact not, or that they do do um, rigorous peer review when they, when they don't or they have no peer review at all. Deviations from best practices could be that they don't even have a retraction policy. So um, if there's papers that um, comes out that there's been you know, some misconduct, you might not have an actual policy with what to do in that situation, how to retract that paper. And they might also request a transfer of copyright when you're publishing in an open access article, which is not that common, or they might not even specify if they have a Creative Com Commons license if it's an open access journal. And quite often, um, predatory publishers tend to be open access um, because they will want to attract um, researchers that you know want to have a large um, authorship, uh, re readership, and hopefully get um, high citations. With lack of transparency, again, that could be that they don't provide any contact information or, or not correct contact information, and they might not have any details about what the article processing charges are. So when you publish a manuscript in a journal, you'll usually pay some sort of admin fee called an article processing fee or, or an article processing charge. They might not have any details about it until you've, uh, the paper's been accepted and then all of a sudden you hear of this fee for the first time. They might also have, <coughs> oh, pardon me. They might have editors or editorial board, board members that can't be verified. So either it's not updated contact details, might not be the up-to-date institution, or again, it might not be anyone that actually exists in real life or it's um, other well-known researchers that have actually not um, okay to be in the editorial board of this journal. Aggressive solicitation. So again, you might have received emails. Unfortunately, this is quite common. When you're just starting out in research and you start publishing, you might receive these emails from editors, usually very flattering. They'll say they read your last publication. They might mention the actual title of it and say, you know, they loved it. And they really want you to submit to their forthcoming issue. And there's a special issue. Usually there'll be some sort of urgency that really short um, closing date, you know, a few weeks away, you need to submit. Quite often, um, because they'll send, they'll kind of scrape websites, they'll just send these emails to thousands of people. Quite often the journal scope is not within your expertise. So you might be a researcher in um, chemical engineering, and they're asking you to submit to a journal that specializes in economics or something completely different. Sometimes they might get it a little bit right, um, but you can usually tell as well that, um, you know, it's not, it's not quite your field. Um, so you, know, you might be wondering why did they sort of single me out? Well, because they didn't, because so they would have sent it to thousands of um, researchers. Um, quite often these predatory publishers and journals will have a very broad scope of the kind of manuscripts they accept and um, even across disciplines. That's sort of usually a warning sign when they publish anything from, you know, social science, humanities type papers to um, research articles. Quite often they will have open pub access publishing and a processing fee. Quite often it will be lower than the typical open access fees. 
for example, just like $150. <coughs> Pardon me, I think too much. Um, and quite often they'll have very poor or even no non-existent editorial and peer review standards. They are basically known for publishing anything. Sometimes they might actually ask for peer reviewers to go through the manuscript. They get review reports back, but the editor don't take them into account. The authors are not asked to revise the manuscript at all. It's just published as it is. They're claiming that that's, you know, they have done peer review. Um, more seriously, perhaps, is that they quite often have no archival policy. So you might um, pay this fee, you get it published, but then the website might be down next year and there's no way to prove that you've published anywhere, but it's been accepted. Um, so you've paid this fee and no one can read your research, no one can, can reference it or cite it. Another sort of warning sign is that sometimes when you subscript, submit your manuscripts, it's to an email instead of an online um, submission system. It's just to an email and it might be quite unprofessional sounding, like it could have a at Yahoo or at Gmail domain, for example. It's not always a warning um, sign because new journals or even some society journals from some countries that might not have a lot of funding, they might share some of these characteristics, um, some of these predatory publishers, for example, they might not be indexed yet if it's a new journal, or the website might look a bit unprofessional. So they don't have all the resources to, to have like a web design team. <coughs> this is just an example of a paper that was basically nonsense. Um, so the authors here have just sort of made up their names and their institutions. And they've made up this paper to kind of test or prove that some journals will publish anything. And it's of course been retracted now, but I've, I have um, taken some screenshots of uh, what it said inside some of the inside um, the paper. So, for example, it said the studies one and two were conducted in the author's office chair, IKEA in France, multicentric on July twentieth, twenty twenty. Study two was excluded from analysis or from this paper as it did not results, i.e. the results we wanted. So complete nonsense paper. I went through peer review, supposedly, was published. Um, and all the, the authors behind us then, of course, straight away um, went to, to the press just to prove and to show that, yeah, this is sort of a test. We just wanted to see if it got published, and it did. And of course, now it's retracted. So different types of predatory publishers. Um, they're actually, unfortunately, getting more and more sophisticated. There's something called imposter or hijacker journals. So they will actually copy the website, like the look of the website of a, of a real legitimate journal. They might even plagiarize real content. So they might actually steal um, papers and add it to their website. Quite often the name of the journal is very similar to the legitimate journal that they're sort of copying. Or they might just add a word like advances or reports to the end of it. Um, so yeah, they might charge these article processing fees and they might just close down the copy website the next you know, month and then it's nowhere to be seen. And there's also Trojan horse journals, um, very similar to the imposter hijacker journals, but you know, the website on the surface looks really nice, but when you actually click on any of the menus, it's completely empty. There's no pages there. The only thing that works is the landing page website and then potentially the submitting of your um, article. Sometimes they might have plagiarized content, but sometimes they don't. And then there's, of course, Fisher emails. They might lure you in with very large promises of guaranteeing to publish your article really quickly. And um, they will charge very high article processing fees, even without having signed anything, no paperwork saying that it's been accepted. They charge, charge you, and then you never hear from them again, and they don't publish anything. Just check how we do the time. Good. Oh, so how can you best avoid them? So when you get an email um, solicitation or, or an email solicitation to submit a manuscript um, to a journal, you know, you should be cautious and suspicious. You know, ask yourself, have you heard of the journal or the publisher before? Have you actually read or cited papers from this journal or publisher? And are they indexed? If they claim to be indexed in the Web of Science, you can easily check this on the master journalist. Do they have an impact factor? 
Are they asking you to be a guest editor, even if you're a very junior researcher? You, know, you might be you know, very early on in your research career. You might only publish one paper. If someone asks you to be an editor, um, you, know, you should definitely be suspicious of that. Um, or are they asking you to submit to a journal that's um, not really within your area of expertise? It's also a bit suspicious. And you should go and check out their website. You know, do they state specifically what their peer review and editorial policies are? Do they have a clear ethics statement on their website? Do they offer EOI, so that digital object identifier, or archival services? Is that part of the article processing fee or not? Not all journals offer this, uh, especially like DOIs, but most of them do nowadays. Just make it be sure that you understand what it is that you're actually paying for when you're paying the article processing fee. But who is on the editorial board? Is it easy to see who is? Can you verify um, who they are? Do they have actual you know, institution names and contact details? And you can also look at the quality of the publications from their past issues. So I'll say something about quality of the journal as well. You can see, for example, that previous example with that nonsense paper. If it looks like you know, it hasn't had a lot of copy editing or editorial um, uh, you know, no sort of editorial copy editing, then it's probably not a high quality journal. Um, and also, do they promise to publish your paper in a very short time? Unfortunately, as you might know, publishing does take a very long time. A lot of this is the peer review process. So if they pu promise to publish your paper in just a few weeks, it's so very unrealistic that there's time to secure peer reviewers, get the peer review reports back for the editor to look, look it all over and then publish your paper. Usually it'll be months. They should be suspicious if they're claiming that they can do all that in just a few weeks time. So another good website is thinkcheck.submit.org. Um, it also got some really good checklists and guidelines if you're sort of worried about whether a journal might be a editorial journal or not. They also have a website for conferences check submit for conferences I think it is and um, there's sort of little predatory publish uh, conferences out there now unfortunately there's also a website called predatoryjournals.com um, it lists all currently known predatory publishers hijacked journals so it gets updated frequently and it also lists questionable indexes so you get um, a lot of predatory publishers make up their own index you know they just make up saying that we're indexed here but it's not actually a real one, or it's one that they um, that they make up and control. So um, now I'm going to give you some tips on choosing the right journal for your manuscript. Um, I'm going to show you what the master journalist is. It's a free tool um, by Firebase, and I'll talk a little bit about um, journal characteristics that you might want to be aware of and know. And when you're sort of looking and comparing journals to find what's right for your current manuscript. Um, I'd say it's a good idea to already know which journal you want to submit to before you start writing up your research, because journals will have different styles and formats. You know, not all journals will accept different types of, you know, um, research article, or is it a technical note, or is it a literature review? So you should sort of be aware. And it's also recommended to maybe have a bit of a, a list, like your first forward, like a first um, choice uh, journal, and then maybe a second choice, third choice, etc. And the master journalist, which can be reached at mjl.clarate.com, um, can help you sort of narrow down journal options because there's of course thousands of journals out there now, especially you know since every, a lot of them moved online. There's just new journals um, being published all the time, so it might seem a bit um, overwhelming to help. You choose but um, but the master journalist can help you narrow down some options based on your particular research topic and what goals you have for your manuscript and again because the web of science um, does not index all journals it's it's a very uh, select uh, selection of journals that's been curated for for high quality so it's a good way to start with you know the top journals um, then you can always have a sort of second, third, fourth option later on. So with the master journalist, you can check what the journal scope is and what requirements this particular different journals have for the different types of submissions. 
and you can get information about the journal through these different journal characteristics that can help you decide. Within the master journal list, there's also the manuscript matcher tool. So if you've already written up your paper or if you've already submitted it somewhere and it got rejected, you don't have a, another option, you can add in the title and abstract and get a good list of journal matches. This is what um, the master journal list looks like. And in particular, the, the manuscript matcher box is sort of open here. So you just copy paste in the title and abstract and you get a list journals that match that and you can click on each one and, and read a bit more about the different journal characteristics to help you decide. And when I say journal characteristics, what do I mean? Um, of course, you'll know uh, if it's indexed, where it's indexed. Within the web of science, there are different indices as well. You know, there's like the science citation index, there's the emerging sources index as different indexes. It'll say that there's an impact factor, like the current impact factor. You can also see how this um, has changed over time. And if you don't know, the impact factor or journal impact factor um, is a value to, or it's, yeah, sort of a metric that's used to grade journals because it says something about how many citations and um, papers in the journal have received based on how many um, papers they publish. So in this sort of example here for nature in 2017, it had an impact factor of 41.577. And we get that by taking all citations in that year, 2017. So all papers out there that cite nature papers um, in 2017, and that was 74,090. And then you take the total number of publications that was published in the two years prior, so in 2015 and 16, and that was 880 and 902. If you add those up and divide by the citations, you get 41.57, which is a very, very high number. Majority of journals will have an impact factor of you know, one or three and can still be very, very good. And of course, it also um, has a massive differences between fields. Some fields don't, you know, don't publish as much or citations, just takes a lot longer just uh, to build up. Other things you might want to look at is how often do they publish? Um, some journals only publish once a year or twice a year. Others, for example, tends to be more common for uh, online journals. They might publish as soon as they get papers that are accepted, or they might publish uh, um, an issue monthly. So you might, um, you know, you might be wanting to publish something for your PhD defense or something like that. You might, you know, really want to get it over and done with before you start your next, you know, job at somewhere else. You can also sort of estimate your chances of getting published. So often have uh, data on the percentage of submissions that are accepted and published. You might also care about who um, the readers are. So do you wanna reach a more like a broad general audience or is this particular research of yours, you know, does it fit a more niche audience um, instead? Um, you might want to know whether it's open access or not. Some funders nowadays have mandates of research that they fund has to be open access. So you can sort of filter for that as well, look at all open access um, papers within um, your particular area. You can also see data such as the average number of weeks from submission to publication. That's just something about how quickly they um, will publish your, your, your paper once it's been submitted. And you can also say something about the type of peer review. So that could be single blind, double blind, open peer review, or they might have a, a unique form of peer review that matters to you, then yeah, that can help you decide as well that um, journal is right for your manuscript. So that was just um, quickly about that. Now, researcher profiles, again, this is a pretty short section. And there should be plenty of time for questions at the end. So when it comes to researcher profiles, I just quickly want to talk about the metrics and what that is, why research fields and keywords on your researcher profiles are important, different platform options that are out there now, and also promoting yourself and how important that is um, using you know, social media and other online tools. So Bibliometrics is a way to uh, quantitatively analyze um, a researcher's impact. The quantity is something to do with you know, numbers, the amount, 
And that's meant to complement qualitative indicators, something that says more about the quality of someone's research that could be grants or awards, you know, if they've got a patent or something like that. And um, so, but quantity is quantitatively, you know, it's more about the just numbers. And I, I know a lot of researchers don't like to be um, summarized into numbers, but for some ways, you know, it is easier to compare if it's, you know, specific numbers. And again, it's meant to complement qualitative indicators. Um, but on researcher profiles, you quite often will have a different metrics. Um, when it comes to publications, usually you'll have a number for the total number of citations. So that's the total number of citations all your publications have received. Sometimes you'll have this number that excludes cell citations. Um, there could be different indexes. The H index is probably the most widely used. That says something about how many publications you have and how many citations they've each received. So if you have an H index of five, it means you've published at least five papers with at least five citations each. So you might have actually published six papers, but one of them was quite recently and has only received you know, one or two citations so far, but all the other five have at least five citations. So you have an H index of five. Um, usually there'll be total number of publications, but it can also be uh, in percentiles. So it sort of compares you a bit more to your field. So, you know, I might say that you're, you publish in the top 5% of chemistry in your institution or in your country or something like that. So um, research fields and keywords, why this is important? This is very much from a peer review perspective, I think for, for editors as well, but also for other things. So. When you have a researcher profile, so this of course could be your university one, or it could be another um, researcher profile that I'll talk a little bit more about later. So you quite often have your bio, you'll have your metrics, and quite often you'll have keywords or research fields, which describes your research field, like what particular field are you in. Um, within the bio, you know, you can expand upon what previous work you've done, or you can even add some research fields of what previous stuff you've done. But the most important stuff is, um, what you're currently working on, and you can expand on that in a short bio, uh, as well as research fields or keywords. It's good to know that sometimes specialist words, um, there can be an overlap between different fields. So for example, we just put imaging, that can mean something within the medical research field, and it can mean something completely different in engineering, for example. So it's quite helpful to also have some more generic keywords so that you know, you're within yeah, chemical engineering or whatever, as well as the really specific specialist keywords as well. And this uh, makes it a lot easier for others to find you. Um, editors looking for reviewers especially, but also students that might be looking for a master's supervisor, a PhD supervisor, postdoc advisor, they'll know more specifically if they're aligned um, to someone that they want to work with. When new uh, research is published, quite often more sort of public uh, news media or science public news will also uh, be looking for experts to comment on that piece of research. So someone that wasn't directly involved in the research. Um, so that will be an easy way to find you if they know yeah, this and this person from that university also specializes in this particular research field or keyword. It could also be other researchers looking for you know, new collaborators. Um, it could be you know, someone wants to expand their data set or they want, they need samples from a particular region. So trying to find someone you know, working with something similar in a particular region. So it'll be a lot easier to facilitate um, collaborations if you have a really clear researcher profile and it's making it really clear what your spe speciality and your expertise is. But it can also be um, other kinds of reviewers such as grant application reviewers looking for an author profile, if there's any additional information that wasn't included on the grant application, that just makes it a lot easier for them to find you as well. So of course, um, there's a lot of research profile platforms out there. Um, they're meant to be kind of like a public researcher CV. Quite often anyone can see your page, even if they don't have a, a profile themselves. And some of the better well-known ones are ResearchGate, Mendeley, and Orchid, Poplons, or the Web of Science Research ID. Some of these are really cool because they'll have 
you know, might have job posting boards or there might be information on grants you can apply for or they'll have different forums or discussion groups based on different topics so it's sort of a different way to engage with researchers in your field across the globe ORCID is more of a like an idea and identifier so for example if you're a female researcher and you get married and you change your name you might have published under different names it'll just it's an easy way to make sure that you know, it's verified that you know, you're the same person you know, even though the name is different for example there's also many researchers in some countries, some names will be very common, for example, in like, the examples often used with like China, for example, like Z, like XIE is a very common surname. You know, you'll have a lot of people with simple, like the same initial and that surname, but just to make sure, you know, who's who, that's sort of what the orchid is supposed to be for. And, and the Web of Science also has a researcher ID. And of course, Publums is more of a platform that started um, to, to verify peer review and editorial work that you do. So it's, we're working with um, publishers and journals um, to verify that. So you can show like everything, not just the, you know, your publications and citations, but also the peer review work, editorial work that you might be doing um, as sort of a service for your field. And lastly, just um, some tips on, you know, promoting yourself. Being in academia nowadays is pretty competitive, as you probably know. And um, promoting both you, but also your research will help increase the impact. So when it comes to uh, publishing, that's you know, number of reads or number of citations, um, or you know, increasing all metric scores. If you haven't seen that before, this image here is a all metric donut. It has like a total value that's assigned to a paper. It says something about how many news stations has you know picked up your research or mentioned it, or how many blogs or how many have tweeted about it, or you know how many citations are reads. Just sort of a different um, uh, measure for, for impact or, or the reach of your research. Besides researcher profiles, and um, you can also have a personal website. Um, this is quite common nowadays that researchers have a, a personal website that's easily discoverable. And that's so that you can have, you know, whichever format you want, if you want to share uh, something a bit more what you're currently working on, for example, or you might want to share um, conference presentations or poster presentations or photos from field work and just put a bit more of a personal spin on it than what a researcher profile can do. And um, similarly, you can do that with social media and sort of create a bit of a following. And um, a lot of researchers use Twitter and LinkedIn now. You can share photos, for example, from conferences or tweet about you know, who's presenting at conferences and sort of um, get a bit of a following so that whenever you publish uh, anything, you, you know, you can see that lots of people are sort of engaging with your content. And I think both institutions and funders like to see that as well, sort of, you know, that you're reaching the end user in a different um, way than just through typical um, uh, publishing journal article or going to conferences. And yeah, if you think about, um, you know, anything, additional that you can add to a grant or a job or even tenure application will make you stand out. You can't change the number of publications or citations you have. But for example, um, if you always make yourself available and can become a well-known expert in your field so that you're called upon again and again from media or press to comment on research, that's just showing you know, a different venue that you're also engaging in. Or if you can do community outreach, you know, you can just do presentation at a local museum, for example, or a school, or especially if it's your research is impacting, you know, end users or specific people in a particular area, just to show that you're actually reaching, you know, the end user that will benefit from the research. Um, that's usually something that's considered a plus as well in funding and grant applications and job applications. And that was what I wanted to share today. Hopefully there should still be Plenty of time for questions. Um, again, if you'll be sending sent the slides, these are all the links, um, the slides, and I'll just stop sharing and we can or stop recording, sorry.